So um, not sure. Well, you know, if I'm like in person, I can ask how many of you are already working with microservices and then how many of you are kind of focusing on, uh, you know, kind of dealing with stateful. But of course, now I can't see. So hopefully you'll come to my Q&A session and then we we can have further discussion too. So, so here it is. So topic is about exploring. So I'm not going to be like saying that this is how you do it kind of thing, but just present to you, you know, all the um, kind of techniques and things that you can use to help you to build stateful like microservices. So, but first of all, right, I have to have some assumption, maybe not everybody uh, coming in here are, you know, familiar with it. So I'm going to do a bit of a uh, introduction to uh, some basic concepts. So here it is. So, uh, okay, let me click. Oh, okay. First of all, if you are interested in this slide deck, um, as you are following along, you're welcome to, uh, you know, follow, well, kind of basically access this too. So this is a share link. So to my, uh, you know, on, on my Google Doc. So if you want to do that, I leave here for two more seconds and then I'm going to switch, right? Okay. All right. Even if you miss, don't worry, because I'm going to share this slide deck uh, with the organizing team too, who are kind of wonderful folks. So really happy to be here. And here it is. So I give a little bit introduction of myself. Maybe some of you came to my previous uh, talks too, and I was doing mostly reactive back then. But since then, I've changed to another team, which is the WebSphere uh, Open Liberty team. Uh, but I, my focus, though, is on open source uh, Java libraries, um, such as Open Liberty, MicroProfile, and like Jakarta EE, which is the Java Enterprise Edition uh, standard, the spec, right? So that's what I'm focusing on, and um, essentially too. I am doing things on uh, open source, Java, cloud, DevOps, and uh, enterprise distributed systems are really my area, um, the kind of my passion too, like dealing with event-driven messaging, those things. So, and I have over 25 years of software uh, engineering experience um, that span a whole you know wide range of stuff from financial, from uh, stock, uh, not quite stock, but futures and options trading um, from manufacturing, from cell phone company, for example. So I kind of understand, you know, what it is that um, maybe most of you are working on, you know, with these systems kind of operation for your business. So, and I, um, I'm i also the president of the Chicago Java Uses Group. So I'd like to invite you to join my group too. I'll have information on that towards the end of the presentation. And then I'm also a tech community organizers for a number of meetups too. And I'm also a church volunteer. So <clears throat> start with some basic now. So let's kind of talk a bit, a bit about stateful versus stateless. Now, I'm, I'm sure that if you are working with cloud native and what you have been hearing too everywhere is they're talking about stateless. And then there's also the serverless side of things. They aren't really quite the same, right? And it's not actually the same serverless and then stateless. Sometimes I feel that folks may be kind of mingling the two. But here it is, right? When I'm referring to state, state is really the capture, the overall state of your server, right? So, um, and what defines a state is the data. So stateful is it, it, as such is meaning that, you know, full of data, full of data, let's go. It's, do it like this. But essentially, too, is we're think we're talking about data, the state of data. Stateful is to maintain the state. So let's kind of take a look. And also before I go into it, too, as you can see, right, I decided, you know, on a topic that, you know, can be kind of dry, you know, this kind of sometimes you get into all these deep talk and then it's kind of, you know, dry in the sense that it's kind of we just talk about all these things. But let's make it a little more fun. So I'm using using an example of this cartoon. Uh, finding Nemo. So if you're familiar with it, which I believe most of you are, right? So I'm using this as an example, as an analogy, even though it's kind of a bit of a, um, you know, superficial way, but still I think it illustrates, right? Stateful versus stateless. So as you are familiar, if you're familiar with the story, right? It's the little fish, uh, Nemo in here that got lost. So the daddy fish, big marlin, um, was out going into the ocean looking for his son. And in the meantime, he was swimming in the ocean. Then he ran into another, he met another fish, right? Swimming too. And it's the blue one, uh, blue Dory. And Blo Dory is this forgetful fish, right? And kind of, he, she doesn't remember anything. But as you can see too, she's, she was very agile. You know, if I use computing terms, right? Or, you know, work terms, very agile. What does it mean? It means, you know, if you need to do something, you don't think twice. You just jump and kind of a happy-go-lucky, so to speak, right? Like I just want something, I go do it and, and, you know, I see like a bunch of like jellyfish, you know, they can sting. 
she jumps on it because she has no memory. She has no, um, not capable of making any, you know, kind of connection with anything because she doesn't remember anything essentially. But Marlin, you know, whereas, you know, being a dad and everything, of course, he cares about everything. He remembers everything. So he would be going after Dory and getting nervous and said, Dory, don't do this or something like that. Um, for example, don't get near the jellyfish because the jellyfish can hurt you, can sting you, right? Like that. So it, as you can see, you may be like understanding why I'm using this as an example. So let's kind of go back to a bit more the interpretation of this uh, terminology, right? So computing life used to be simpler. Simpler in the sense that, you know, we used to have more stateless computing and why. So essentially stateless computing is a communication protocol that does not retain any session information. So we, as we all know, right, working in today's world, everything is highly distributed. Um, data is being flow from one component to the other, or you know, you're doing data manipulation and transformation at any time. So for stateless computing, it's more about you know, kind of being functional, right? If you think of the, the programming style, kind of more functional. You want something gets done, you kind of give it, you know, the the, the method essentially, and transform your data. You get your output, and then you're done. You don't care. You don't really record anything in between, you know, the transactions. So as a result of this, the architecture implementation design of all of your systems, if you're doing stateless, then it would be simpler because there's no need for you to, let's say, right, if something goes wrong, um, you need to like recover, right? And you need to spin up another component, let's say in Kubernetes, um, when, you know, all your components are being replicated in a cluster and all of these things, if you need to, you know, something goes wrong, you need to, you know, get, you know, another component to be in, add, it, add that into your processor. It's easier, right? It's very scale. The scalability is also very easier, much easier too, because you can just spin up another component and other worker nodes without worrying about initializing to some state, right? So to speak. So that's stateless. So kind of a quickly kind of describe it. But as you can see too, realistically, and even if we look at the cartoon, it doesn't work, you know, if you don't remember anything, right? And how can you function, right? Think of the fact that you forget the birthday of your wife or of your, you know, if you're a lady for your husband, think of the other person, they would be upset, right? If you don't remember anything every day, you're just happy go lucky, it won't work. So let's take a look, right? So stateful computing is just the opposite. It's basically the state of the data gets recorded at every step, you know, along the way in your processing. Um, it's being kept and uh, across all transactions and can be like in a session, right? Uh, the context or like essentially globally, as long as your server is running, right? The, the data is being kept um, kind of alive. Or, you know, some cases too, then stateful, essentially we're kind of referring to permanent storage, right? Persistent storage, like database or some file system like that. That's more about dealing with stateful computing. So as a result too, you know, as opposed to stateless computing, then if you want to scale your system, it's also harder because anytime some component kind of drops, you need to kind of spin up another component. Like let's say again in Kubernetes, you need to like start another node. That node needs to be initialized to be as the same state as everybody else. Um, likewise too, you know, if, if you need, you know, recover, recoverability, or you, if you need to scale your system anytime, any new things, you need to make sure the state is the same. It takes more work, you know, you're coding everything you need to keep track. It's more complicated. Okay, then let's take a look then after some kind of initial kind of clarification of this topic, then let's, let's take a look, right? So we are now living in the cloud days, you know, what about, you know, before the cloud, you know, how was uh, stateful, uh, you know, statefulness, let's like, put it that way, being like done, right? In the, let's say, even not going back all the way is client server systems time, right? That's mostly in the late nineties or nineties, right? And uh, when computers, I think since, especially since the internet comes into play. So let's take a look at how <clears throat> the mechanism is uh, to handle statefulness. So <clears throat> when we look, you know, in the server side too, even before the cloud days, we rely on the database, right? You have database engine that actually it has a mechanism of doing transaction. And if you're familiar too, right? You, I'm sure a lot of you folks, if you're doing Java applications, enterprise, you know, I say 100% of you are using database in some form of shape, right? Even if you say I don't use related or, um, you know, relational database, you could be using a file system, for example, or object, you know, or uh, object database, whatever, some kind of persistent storage. 
So let's say, right, if take example of a uh, relational database, very often they also have the database uh, kind of transactional capability. Often too, it's also built in. So if you're doing, you know, SQL to query it, um, all of these things is automatically, is implicit. So your database engine will take care of keeping the transaction of all of your calls. But of course, on a programmer's perspective, you can also have what they call like user uh, kind of customize uh, user control type of uh, transaction. So you can actually control your tra transaction too. And then I want to bring to your attention too, there's also a protocol, it's called two-phase commit. So two, now think of it this way, right? When we work with database back in the days, right? It's kind of more legacy. We now call it legacy or kind of monoliths type of application. Then you normally only have one database. So in a one database case, then it's not as complicated. However, we live in a complicated world. As we all know, if you work on systems that are part of a larger system, and if you're an architect, you oversee a whole system, very often too, one database is not enough. You're going to need, you know, multiple, let's say instances of your database too. And then, or sometimes too, the challenging thing could be you have different uh, vendor kind of database engine. You could have, let's say, you know, a uh, complicated e-commerce system. You can have order entry being kept, you know, on let's say IBM, you know, we have DB2. And then another system, maybe, um, you know, in, in some older system, you actually were keeping your, uh, what what is it, the, the enterprise, um, there, there's a term, right? That the resource ER, ERP system, for example, they are like on Oracle, for example, uh, even Sybase, something. So as a result too, if you know you have your systems that are kind of dealing with so many different database, different vendors running in their own space, you need to have some way of coordinating, you know, that whole transaction that is like touching on every single database in there. So there's this protocol called two-phase commit it is still being used. So let me kind of give you a quick idea. So what it does is that it has a, a concept, right, of a coordinator. So the two-phase commit coordinator, its job is to kind of essentially, right, coordinate a whole transaction that flows through your system. So now the way it works is that two-phase commit is think of it, you know, if you are like a, a, a person, right, a coordinator in, in some kind of events kind of thing. So the coordinator would be the one that's kind of like taking results of polling, kind of polling everybody. So let's say I have three databases, let's not make it way too complicated. So I will be going to DB2 and said, okay, you know, we need to do this now. Some order entry comes in, you know, go to the order database. And there's be some way of this coordinator asking the DB2, okay, are you done with your work? You know, if, is it good? You know, the result is good, then it keeps track of it. Then in this case, a coordinator will keep asking, right? The next database, let's say Oracle, I'll do the same thing. Okay, are you done with your work? You know, the, the thing is maybe I'm, you know, kind of fetching some uh, customer data, right? It's an ERP type of system. Then it says, okay, I'm good. Then it collects the vote, then goes to the third, another database and so on and so forth. So after this coordinator collects all of the vote, then it would go back and say, okay, now DB2, you can commit now, and then going to Oracle, commit, you know, and commit, commit. So everything you do is pretty kind of sequential, but as you can see, there's a drawback in this case because then it is very synchronous, right? So let's say you are working with um, database one, the DB2 one, and then the rest of them, you know what they do? They just sit there and wait, you know, because that's, that's how it is. The protocol is you need to wait for the coordinator to tell you what to do or give him or her, the coordinator, the information. So as you can see, this protocol, it works well. But the thing is too, is there's issue with the synchronous nature and it's also performance wise is slow in this case right it doesn't isn't like an asynchronous type of way um and besides you know one thing is that everybody we like to think of we write code you know we are assuming everything works perfectly and also on top of that the network is you know works but guess what everybody knows right you have run it we all have run into situation of the network suddenly gone down some glitch you can connect it's very very you know, kind of likely the network is never reliable. And let's say if you're on mobile devices, small devices is even worse, right? That kind of thing, this bandwidth is not there, all these things. So as a result, as you can see, you know, two-phase commit is not an ideal protocol, although it is still being used today. For example, some of the, you know, Kubernetes are inside, right? Internally is still managing some of the database sharding and all of these things. It, it is still being used, don't get me wrong. And it is a protocol that works well, but there's concern of it being slower because of the synchronous nature. So, okay, so I spent enough time talking about this, but that's kind of essentially how, you know, kind of two-phase commit is kind of the way, you know, used to be. Um, and then now we turn to Java. This is a Java conference. I work with Java. So as we all know, then there's enterprise EJB, right? In the enterprise Java spec, um, 
And in EJP2, we know there's also stateful uh, EJP. So as such, right, stateful, you can have stateful session being. So that means that, you know, the state of your data is being kept, you know, valid, right? Kind of um, kept up, right? During the, a session, let's say a session that comes in the request and the client with the server during the session is fine. As long as the connection is there, your data is being kept kind of up to date. However, when the session goes away, then the whole you lose your data because it doesn't do any persistence to the database so that's stateful but it has its purpose too it's valid for the session kind of duration and then there's also then ent entity beans if you need something more persistent then entity beans is the one that works that gets mapped to some permanent uh, persistent storage right it can be database and then you very often do like what we used to do is using hibernate or something to kind of do all of the mapping but then you can do use ent entity beans um, and then on the website, then you have HTTP session. Um, that's how kind of servlets can kind of work with to maintain state. Now, let's then take a look <clears throat> into client-side caching of your server responses. Now, everybody, I'm sure if you work with web technology, then you'll be working, you have worked with cookies, or even if you have not, we are definitely, you know, we're, we kind of use cookies. And the purpose of the cookies is to kind of help with persistence. And essentially it carries with it, you know, for authentication, um, it's the session ID, right? So when cookies, um, kind of this responsibility, every time some request comes in, then the cookies will be sent, right? And on your client side, let's say on your browser, you keep, you know, your session ID. And then that actually every request, your session ID will be sent over if it's a fresh one, especially you go to your server side and then present your token. And if it's accepted, then then you basically the request will go back and tell the client, OK, now you can send the payload over. But as you can see, it's a little bit less performant in that sense. You need to make multiple trips now for like newer kind of way of doing things. And everybody is probably familiar is using the JSON web token. That's also very popular. Um, and this also doesn't, you know, kind of restrict you to any languages, right? As long as you support that. So it's, it's JWT. So JWT, or it's also called JOT, as, as I recently found out, right? A kind of acronym. Uh, so that's token based, right? So essentially the JOT to the, diff, the one big difference is more efficient is because it carries with it the session ID and also the payload at the same time. And then it gets you know kind of trend over the wire over to the server side present you know this whole thing and the server side look at your session id if it's authenticated then it will just say okay all good then you already have your payload data then the server can process it so anyway these are like some of the examples of how we kind of work with in the client server days you know that's what we kind of handle um, uh, kind of uh, preserving data so let's now then take a look in, at uh, stateful microservices in the cloud native environments. Now, if especially if you're already working with cloud native or quite familiar with it, right? Everybody will be asking, well, cloud native is really all about stateless containers, you know, kind of a lot of times are, you know, very often on the application level, we are working with microservices. And as we all know, it's supposed to be small bite size and no state and all of these things. So we will be scratching our head then how do we deal with like persistence, right? When you need the data to be preserved, how do we do it? So that's the whole thing about this session is to kind of talk about it. So essentially let's kind of quickly also go over some basics of cloud native, right? And, and it, because that also can be a confusion sometimes. Um, and in my mind, you know, I'm thinking, you know, the way I look at it is that cloud native is essentially you extend, you know, cloud computing because cloud computing you know, the, the whole cloud kind of evolution, right, that, that where we come in today really started off more on the infrastructure side, right? And we're talking about a lot of times we're, you know, all talking about Kubernetes now. Think of the whole uh, KubeCon, right? For example, it's just a whole entire conference talking about anything that has to do with containers and orchestrator, which is K Kubernetes, right, as it is today. I mean, we have other container orchestrator too, but Kube, you know, Kubernetes definitely is the one or variant of such, right? So anyway, uh, going back to this cloud native computing, so it's really addressing some true needs of applications that are running on top in a, you know, on, on all of the cloud infrastructure, which is a lot of containers and, you know, you have containers being like managed by Kubernetes that's all replicated, all kind of in a cluster and very, you know, resilient, all of these things. So. Now, operating in this environment is also not very easy, as we all know. So it, now the cloud native, the term too, was actually um, 
initial or kind of coined, you know, by Netflix because Netflix dealing with all of these streaming data has to be so efficient and and you know dealing with concurrency and everything. So they essentially too high level goals is that we want these systems to be highly available, right? All of your data and everything highly available system, very scalable. If there are more load, then you know you you need you know kind of ways of kind of increasing the number of processors and then very performant too, right? You you don't want any response you know, uh, kind of like suffer, right? There's no downtime essentially. So that's essentially cloud native in a nutshell on a high level, but how to do it is another story. So many things, right? So now we have to talk about how do we deal with persisting data? Um, and also a note too about it. I find cloud native is interesting. Um, the concept is in fact, you know, very much kind of shares the same goals around well, at least overlapping a few goals with the reactive way of doing things. So I have a slide to talk about it too, because that was, that was what I talked about previously. So anyway, but back to this cloud native, I keep kind of deviating, sorry. So let's back to this cloud native. So how, how do we do cloud native, right? What, what is it if I were asked of it? Then very often too, we kind of come up with, okay, there's a set of guidelines. It's actually developed or drafted up uh, by Heroku, right? The, the folks, the developers, engineers, very, you know, kind of focusing on all of the development is essentially what 12 factor application should be, right? It's defined a set of guidelines for developing like portable uh, applications and very resilient that are well suited to be a, a cloud environment. So uh, let's take a look. So one of the factors too of all the 12 things is basically it talks about the need for self-contained uh, services, right, that can be deployed as stateless processes. And microservices architecture so far is the one that can satisfy such a requirement. Now, the nice thing about microservices is it doesn't dictate what kind of tools you should use or libraries or anything, but it's really a high level concept. It really provides you with the guideline. We all know it's supposed to be very, you know, kind of purposeful very uh, focused on what it needs to do its job. And then also even with all of the uh, resources too, for example, a database very often or some form of persistent storage, um, you can only have like one, you know, connected theoretically, right? Connected with your microservice. So you each kind of sort of individualistic, right? I'm doing my things, small things, but I have my own database kind of concept. Now in reality, I'm questioning it too, but that will be left for another talk. But for now, okay, let's kind of move on and talk about this, uh, you know, uh, cloud native. So here's a list of all of the factors that are being specified. So I won't get into all the details, but as you can see, I just want to quickly skim over it. Um, it deals with essentially the whole life cycle of when you're doing like application development. It, you know, deals with the code base. So you want to have like a, a really good uh, code uh, versioning system, such as like GitHub, right? Or GitLab and all of these. And that's kind of pretty much the, the thing to use. And it has so many kind of like, like a easy integration, right? For example, you, you can have hooks that you can actually kind of link to your CI CD pipeline, things like that, right? Code base has to be very um, kind of capable and being able to get connected, but nothing is really um, tightly coupled in a 12 factor application, as you can see. Now, the next thing is basically is like dealing with dependencies. So all of your dependencies are being declared in a declarative way and also being isolated too. You don't want anything to be really like tightly coupled or hard coded anywhere with your application. So that's with the dependencies. And then there's also configuration. You want to store the config in the environment too. So, um, and then there's also backing service. So backing service such as like database, right? That's an, it, it kind of resources all of these things. They are attached resources. You can have the cache provider, right? Um, caching like Java cache, for example, Jcache. You can um, use like Hazelcast, for example, you can kind of have them as as attached you know resources so they can easily kind of drop in on and off there's no tight kind of like coupling in there and then also the fifth one is everybody probably aware build release run right these days we're talking about continuous integration continuous build continuous deployment so these are really enabled by the devops process um, why because we want everything to kind of like be able to you know, all the changes be kind of uh, integrated quickly and you can deploy it to production very fast, kind of like that. Um, and then not just, well, of course, I'm kind of simplifying. If we deploy, we want to go through still, you know, you go through dev and then QA and then go into the pre-production and then production like that. Okay, and then there's processes. So that's just what we're talking about, stateless processes. And basically it's microservices container are kind of a perfect, you know, way of satisfying this requirement. And then there's also port binding. So you want to export the services via port binding and concurrency too. You want to scale out 
via the process model. So sometimes right, in a Kubernetes kind of world too, we are kind of concurrency can also be achieved through kind of uh, configuration, right? On your uh, infrastructure level, such as like Kubernetes like that too. And of course, you know, also, also on the software level too, you can be doing, you know, doing things that work, that, for example, that would support also concurrency um, with all of your um, kind of uh, components that are running on the system, right? That type of stuff. And then there's also disposability. Essentially, you want to make sure that um, they're fast startup and graceful shutdown of, of all of your microservices, right? And again, it kind of emphasized on the stateless and that's why doing things stateless would be much better because you just spin it up and down without worrying so much. Um, and then dev prod parity, as I talk about, we want to also have be able to have all of your component be run in the same way uh, in, in any environment. Environment in terms of when we're doing development, we have development kind of testing environment, right? Development testing, QA testing, and then very often too, you can have pre-production environment too, and then before you get to the production. So all of these stages, right? All of these environments, um, we want to be kept as similar as possible. And using containers is a really good way because your containers could be all kind of uh, defined in a certain way. You can do, you know, keep the state pretty much the same. And then you just drop them off accordingly in different environments accordingly, whatever you need to do with it, okay? And then now there's also logging. Logging too, we want to treat the logs as event stream. So that's another topic. So event stream is also another um, kind of way of keeping track of things, but still your logging too is also like attached resources that should be kept kind of outside of your main kind of processing. And then admin processes, same thing. You want to run your admin management tasks as one-off processes. So that's kind of essentially sums up, you know, the 12 factor application. And then now then let, let's kind of question that is, is that, well, then, then how do we preserve the state across session, transaction and network boundaries? How do we do it? So <clears throat> first of all, just some techniques and mechanisms that we actually already talked about. That, that means it's not, you know, it's not anything new in there. As we all know, uh, we can make use of caching, right? Um, caching, you can have write your own cache, of course, or, you know, kind of um, in, you know, what we are mostly familiar with, you can actually have different caching provider. As, as I mentioned, right, you can have uh, Java has a specification, the Jcash, um, and Essentially, too, Jcash is defined how you implement all the cache, and then you can have different providers that you can use. There are open source ones, also commercial ones, and for example, things like uh, MongoDB, CouchDB, you know, Hazelcast. All of these Hazelcast supports Jcash too, so you can actually use some of these uh, database kind of um, you know kind of feature to help you with the caching or Redis, right? Those are ones, and then there's also database style transactions. As I talk about, we are still leveraging on the database to to help us with all of these transactional thing, right? Um, and then there are cookies too. So cookies we talked about, sessions, right? And so very often too in your uh, coding construct, you have like sessions like HTTP session or different types of session that helps you, right, on your coding level. And then there's also tokens um, that I talk about, right? Tokens also are carry with it. Um, very often has the session ID, you know, kind of helps you with ID identifying yourself when you're presenting your, you know, kind of a request to your server side. So, so these are sort of like the, on the mechanism technique side. Now let's take a look now then into Kubernetes, right? So we're, as I talk about, you know, everybody's kind of working with Kubernetes these days, so, but so not, I don't need to explain as much what it is, but the thing is, it, its job, right, is to, uh, to be the coordinator, be the orchestrator, right? It orchestrates. It needs to. You need to have somebody coordinating everything. So that's Kubernetes. Now let's kind of take a look then um, into how you know the mechanism within Kubernetes. So Kubernetes too has this uh, built-in uh, kind of a leader election kind of algorithms in it too. So every time when we talk about load balancing systems and you know and and replicating you know between all of them. Um, let's say, right? You you can't you can say okay, we we have replicated components, but you know in in reality too, we do need to make sure that all of these components you know that are running they are all replicated. Let's say take an example why this is important, right? Let's say you know you're you're working with a payment system, so of course too you have payment. Let's say your microservices that handles payment that actually is important because it connects with the payment provider to authorize the payment, something like that, right? So you have multiple copies of these um, payment uh, that are doing the same thing, running, you know, on, let's say on Kubernetes level is managing all of these microservices, then you do need some way of, you know, a an algorithms that kind of manage so that they don't all 
execute their function, right? So now that's kind of important. Like I said, just using an example, right? I, uh, you know, uh, order system comes through the system, you know, comes through the processing flow through the system, then you want to pay. So if I pay, uh, if you don't have a good kind of algorithms to manage it, it end up, it could be like two of the same component can make the payment at the same time to the payment provider. So that's not good because that means your customer get will be getting charged twice, right? Or more than once. So that's not good. And that's why this is important that the algorithms needs to be designed uh, and also to be very efficient. Uh, you don't want, you know, kind of like the, uh, all, you know, the things to be like all, what you call it, like concentrated on one leader doing all of the work, but maybe you can spread out the responsibility, all that kind of stuff I've done, you know, being captured in the leader uh, election algorithm. So so essentially, <clears throat> if you don't do anything to it, but Kubernetes already has it handled underneath the hood, right, unbeknownst to us, and it's called etcd, right, etcd. But the thing is too with the Kubernetes uh, default way of handling this is a bit not very balanced. So if you're in a cluster kind of low balancing situation, this algorithms may not be the ideal. Now, the thing is, it works perfectly fine too, but just not a perfect way. So there are also other leader algorithms being discussed right in the research paper and all of these. But the thing is, I don't want to dwell too much on it. But there you can also kind of let's say use external packages like Apache Zookeeper, it also has the leader election algorithm things and other open source ways of doing it too. So that's Kubernetes. And then let's kind of then move on to the next thing about what Kubernetes has, right. So by its name is stateful sets. So it's already indicating that is the Kubernetes infrastructure layer managing the state of you know these data among the different replicated kind of uh, nodes that it has so stateful sets essentially make sure that all of your you know changes within you know within your component are being tracked properly being managed and revision correctly that type of stuff so that's among a set of things that it needs to do but it's essentially too is the infrastructure layer managing the state of your data right on, on that kind of layer so that's stateful sets and then there's also then persistent volume so persistent volume then as the name implies is basically you can also configure um kubernetes too um how you know do you manage all of the volumes right so that actually deals with more of the disk kind of thing and it's through this abstract kind of persistent volume way of handling things and if you are a client coming in kubernetes client you can actually use persistent volume requests to to kind of request all of these managing all of these volumes and how do you do all of these things now again i won't go into all of the details but just want to present to you this is what say kubernetes has to help you you know on the stateful uh, managing data uh, that type of stuff and replication and all of these things so and then also too for Kubernetes, it has a capability called uh, session affinity and sticky session, what is called like sticky cookie session, right? So as the name implies, sticky is that if something sticks around. So what it is, is that, you know, anytime, right, you have um, requests coming into your system, then essentially you have a cookie, right, that identifies your request. So that one is much like, kind of think of it more like Kubernetes, you know, the, the way it handles the stickiness is kind of like a, a cookies that, you know, not exactly the same, but mechanism maybe share some similarity. Because the idea is that you want that cookies to kind of identify, right, some requests coming in and then identifies to which actually among all of your replicated component, which one is actually handling this particular client. So then the same client requests come in, then you'll be able to identify which one, you know, among the replicated components, which one has handled the request. You want to try to assign the same one to handle the same request because it is just more efficient, you know. Think of you if you call call up customer service for your cell phone and you talk to this one customer rep and then you're telling him all the problems. So this guy knows about it. And then you have to drop, you know, phone call drop, you call back, you want to connect, get connected to the same person answering your phone. So you don't need to repeat yourself again, right? So same kind of concept. So Kubernetes also has this stickiness kind of help with this kind of mechanism too. So, okay. So these are things that Kubernetes can do, but how about, we are all programmers. I mean, presumably most of us, right, are programmers in this conference. So on the programming level, I want to discuss is about uh, the programming design pattern. Um, and I believe another speaker in here, I think Matt, um, um, Matt, Matt uh, from Google, right? He talks more about the choreography, saga pattern, orchestrator. So here it is too. I'm giving you a more broad kind of uh, understanding. So saga pattern too um, is a way of you can, what you can kind of, uh, kind of use, right, in your programming kind of uh, level of work. So Saga essentially helps with your transactions that will span across, you know, multiple services 
Um, so much like earlier when I talk about, let's say, a database, you know, operations or a system that dealing with different components. So you need to have a way of how do you kind of coordinate all of them so then they are doing work, you know, in a very coherent type of fashion. They each operate separately, separately but you need to have that sep um, kind of mechanism. So that's like on the programming level is Saga. And there are two ways, right, or coordination Saga. You can use choreography, which is event driven. Um, so you don't actually require anybody in the middle to tell everybody what to do and all of the, kind of that type of stuff. So it's more event driven. It's more kind of, to me, I feel more like a self kind of initiated kind of way. So I'll give you an example in a second. Um, and then the other way is doing orchestration. It's kind of similar to the two-phase commit I talk about is you need somebody in the middle to kind of coordinate, you know, all of these things. So now, interesting concept too about Saga is that there's no such thing as rollback. So as you know, right, order flows through, anything can go wrong too in any part of your processing. So in that case, you need to tell, you know, the whole thing to kind of roll back. But instead of rolling back, what we have is called compensation. So you do need to write um, code in which is kind of like the compensation module. So if you write something to do some order processing, you also need to have a counterpart as kind of compensator microservice to handle um, in case of some failure, then you kind of have to sort of like uh, restore this uh, kind of state, you know, back to where it was before the transaction starts, right, so to speak. So that's kind of like a, a forward kind of strategy. It's not rollback, although the concept is similar to a rollback because the idea is you want to kind of restore it back, you know, the, the state restore it to it to where it was before kind of thing. Okay, so that's enough of kind of a theoretical, but also then take a look to, I want to introduce to you in what I'm working with by open source, there's MicroProfile, and I'm going to also share with you some resource, but MicroProfile too, as um, yeah, some of you may be aware, is an open source um, uh, Eclipse uh, Foundation project. It's all community driven. Anybody can join too, if you're interested, right? Um, go to the Eclipse Foundation site and find this project, but anyway. So MicroProfile also has many, many features, among which to handle, to support Saga, uh, would be their long running action, which just got released in May. So LRA, so that's actually primarily an orchestrator kind of pattern uh, too. So let me then give, kind of quickly show you. <clears throat> okay, so this is uh, Open Liberty. So if you want to visit that, and I have all the links on my slides, but otherwise, I, let me kind of quickly show you. So you might be saying that while well, I'm just talking. So <clears throat> it's kind of, you know, normally too, maybe my talk is a bit longer. I can go into some of the code, but right now too, the code for this hasn't been written, but let me kind of quickly show you some idea too. Um, so I'm using a choreography and driven uh, saga pattern to kind of handle a shopping cart scenario, order processor, very simplified, simplified version. So let's say, you know, I have some uh, system that handles the order that comes in. I have a Kafka topic, right? That essentially uh, I would generate data when the order comes in, right? Through some front end um, web page or something, it clicks, sends the order over. So my Kafka topic will get a message and get produced. So when it's produced, then I generate an, a, uh, an event called order generated. So then, and, and then, uh, you know, at this point is that the order microservice would be the one that's listening, <clears throat> listening, right? Because event driven is really about event being generated and, and depend on who is listening, who is interested in that kind of thing. But in this case, I've subscribed to the topic, the Kafka topic, that's essentially say a new order comes in. Then my order uh, microservice at this case, in this case, will, get, will be kicked into high gear, has to do its job. So the order, then what it does, it, it maybe set up things in your database, you know, all of these things, and then set up all of these things that needs to be. Then at the same time too, when it's done initializing, you know, this order kind of entering into your system, then it will generate another event. Let's say it's called order created event. So these two, these, this event, order created event can be listened you know, by inventory check microservice and also credit check. So these are important, right? Any kind of time um, order entry comes in, you need to check to make sure, you know, you have the stuff in the inventory, in the warehouse, for example. And then also at the same time, you want to make sure the customer has enough money to pay. So you need to do all of these things. So I have separate microservices that handle these things. And so they each kind of go does its job. And in the meantime too, then I also have maybe have another state 
that also get um, a status that gets sent back to my order and tell it that, okay, inventory check in progress, some kind of event. So order knows then, you know, we also have to essentially keep track of the state of the order itself. So as you can see, microservices, or actually I should say, shopping carts uh, can be complicated in, the, in this sense, because you need to keep track of each and every microservices, their state and everything. And you have to do a lot of this kind of coordination, but choreography is more like a self-initiated thing. You rely on the microservices itself to listen for the right thing and generate the right events accordingly for other components that are listening on it. So, so on, so on, so forth, right? So let's say infant, inventory get checked. Okay. I'm order like 10 bottles of wine. So I do have 10 bottles. So I come back in this case, we we'll say that order inventory checked or validated. So then I will generate this event. This event will be listened on maybe by the payment processor. But at the same time, payment processors also listening for order credit check too. So I have to wait for both events to be ready. Then I can go ahead and process the payment in that case. So let's say everything goes well, then the payment processes, the processor takes over. As we all know, if you have worked with payment, right? Payment then will kind of have to make sure, okay, everything, all the data is here. Then now I will submit the payment. Well, this is the part, right? Where I talk about leader election, something, right? Your, your duplicated components underneath the hood basically have to make sure only one gets to process the payment, right? Not, not, no more than one because then you'll get into trouble, right? Okay. So let's say payment is all good. Then basically um, I would also generate an event that's listened on by the order. I will say, okay, in this case, I said order inventory validated. That's earlier, but I can also have a, an event, right? Order paid. Then it will be basically be listened on by the order. So my order microservice will then update and say, okay, order is now paid. Um, and also to order paid is being kind of uh, sent to or kind of listened on by the shipping processor. So then my shipping processor can know that, okay, now I can go actually get the 10 bottles of wine and then ship it like that. So again, this is a very kind of a simplified kind of way of illustrating how you do it with the saga type of pattern, you know, in a high level sense, right? And also too, I kind of mark it in here too. You can have, you need, do need to write some compensator microservices for cases in which you do need to like, you know, uh, roll back, right? So let's say one step in the process, like credit check does is fail, then the whole thing needs to kind of go back. Then all of these compensator microservices will be kicked into high gear to make sure I kind of roll back, essentially. I use the word rollback, but it's compensating for each one of them. So then nothing gets charged, you know, not, uh, no bottles of wine get kind of, you know, kind of taken out of the warehouse, that type of stuff. So, okay, so that's a really quick example. And I like to kind of talk, <laughs> so I kind of have to make sure I'm kind of keeping, keeping you know, uh, myself to the time is here. And how about reactive? So that's something, right? I, I talked about uh, in my previous, uh, uh, you know, kind of talk here at DevOx. So let's kind of still bring up reactive for a second. Um, reactive is actually um, kind of completely different way of handling um, the, the work, but it's actually a very efficient way of doing things. And as such, right, very quickly in one minute is that reactive systems, essentially it respects the reactive manifesto, which is a set of guidelines as I'm out, you know, kind of outlining here, very responsive systems. Uh, elastic is kind of scalability, resiliency, right? Something goes wrong, I need to have bounce back really quickly. So as you can see, uh, reactive too is, is by its name. It's very reactive, very efficient and loosely coupled all of these good things very message driven. So it's very, also very asynchronous to the whole model and everything. Um, but the thing is with reactive systems, as you know, um, it is handling data in a different way is streaming. All of the data is essentially like streaming through your system. So that's primarily what reactive systems do. And you can basically apply these techniques uh, to kind of put together all of your microservices as well. But of course too, in this case too, it does make the implementation side perhaps a bit more complicated because of this, because of more of the asynchronous kind of style of communication, you need to have um, some mechanisms to make sure you can do a lot of tracking, logging all of these things as well. And that's kind of common, right, for any systems, but for reactive systems might be a little more challenging because of that. But the reactive systems is also good because very often, right, all of your libraries also are built in if they respect the reactive streams specification, which handles like back pressure. So that's actually like very good too. If you are kind of considering, you know, doing high, highly efficient, asynchronous type of processing um, in a very efficient manner, uh, reactive ways is also the way that you can think of doing too. Okay, so now then I think I have five minutes for some quick code samples, but let me kind of bring you to that. So. Here it is too, in my GitHub uh, repository, I have this uh, 
uh, you know, link. So if you have already um, uh, downloaded my slides or kind of connected to the slides, I kind of connected to to you, you can kind of go straight there, or you can also go into our Open Liberty IO guide. So Open Liberty too, that's something I want to introduce to you um, too, if you are new to it. Now, <clears throat> let me kind of take a look. I actually have this up, right? Or actually this is cloud native, okay. Open Liberty. So if you go to openliberty.io, uh, right? So, okay, so Open Liberty is essentially open source um, web sphere. That's the team I'm working with now. So as we all know, if you're familiar, right, with Java, that's um, Java uh, enterprise um, kind of systems that came into being, I think soon after Java was born, right, 26 years ago, then there's also the enterprise side of things. So IBM is really flagship of the WebSphere application server. Um, and it was following all the specs, right, Java, uh, Enterprise, JEE, and then J2EE, JEE, and now is Jakarta EE. So it still respects the Java, you know, it supports all of the Jak uh, Jakarta EE spec, and also works very well with MicroProfile, um, kind of hand in hand, because MicroProfile is also very efficient uh, library that enables you to build um, enterprise level microservices really well. So let's kind of take a look. Open Liberty itself too is now can be used as a runtime. Is think of it like how you used to do Tomcat. You can now like use Open Liberty. Even if you're running Spring Boot, and guess what? Open Liberty can also host your Spring Boot app too. So that's how flexible it is. Also, the best thing of it is open source and it's an open source uh, project that's um, led by uh, IBM. So, and it's open too, as such, you know, if you're interested in joining to be an open source committer, but of course, first you need to join and then kind of get yourself, you know, familiar and all of these, you can, you're welcome to too. So, okay, so that's that. So if you go to openliberty.io, you can go to so as you can see, this one is really like a treasure chest, you know, if you want to learn about Open Liberty, even learn something about Java, we have all of these guides kind of written up very easy to follow kind of guys um, categorized by different um, kind of category. So here today too, we're talking about persistence, but let's also, I want to point out to you, if you want to start, you can actually go to getting started with Open Liberty and all of these kind of, how do you create a RESTful web services is also right there too. And if you see like run in cloud, essentially there's interactive way that you can actually do things on, in your own pace. You don't need to install Java. You don't need to install Docker Hub or Maven, all of these JDK. It actually, everything in the cloud hosted environment is already set up for you. So that's the beauty of it. But again, go back to today is persistence. So if you go to persistence, right, I was going to show you too, you can do things with uh, persistent data in microservice using JPA or, or doing it with MongoDB. I mentioned about, you know, MongoDB is a way, you know, SQL database to help you with caching data, you know, persisting data in the session. And then there's also caching HTTP session data using Jcache and Hazelcast. But I think I may not have enough time to step through um, because I talk too much. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but the thing is too, there's Q&A, so I can further show you there. But if you're interested too, please go to this particular one and also take a look and either the JPA one or MongoDB, whichever ones you like, you can try it. We have more um, kind of uh, guides, you know, kind of tutorials coming out too. So please stay tuned for that. But if you follow this, right, this is actually very self-guided and it also has explaining things for you. So this is really nice. And then you can, what you can do is you can, this one doesn't have it run in cloud, not yet, but team is working on it, but you can actually scroll down and see to it. It gives you instruction of how do you install Docker, for example, because we have examples that also do all of the containerization, things like that and the source code and everything. So I say, suggest that please visit this um, and also get your hands, you know, roll up your sleeve, get your hands into these things. It's actually quite uh, delightful to work with, um, I should say. So yeah, so, so that's that. Okay, and let me go back then <clears throat> to my, um, uh, here, the links. Okay, and I only have very little time left. So, uh, okay, so that's with Jcash and Hazelcast, an example, and others. And then there's also another uh, Open Liberty ad, uh, application. It's more of a prototype, you know, kind of thing. It's from our uh, product manager, too, um, that uh, it's already there. They use Nginx um, and, and then to a uh, controller to work with Kubernetes and Ingress and all of these things um, to show you to kind of how you can kind of leverage on Kubernetes to do the stateful sets, all of these things. So if you want to visit that, you're welcome to also take a look into the source code on that. And then here too is I have a bunch of resources and links for you. Um, so 
over here too, all of the things I've talked about, uh, again, you know, uh, the GitHub, you know, links in here, Saga des design pattern, um, and also MicroProfile LRA. And also the, uh, there's also an LRA long running um, kind of uh, action blog, a MicroProfile blog that was written up by the engineering uh, department. It's really good to talking about, uh, you know, Saga pattern, but the uh, how it's being done in MicroProfile, how it's being supported. So, and all of these other links are Open Liberty, the guides that I just show you, right, in the guides link, and then MicroProfile and also Jakarta EE. So, so these are kind of technology that works together really well. These are all open source, doesn't cost you anything. You can learn at any time and can contribute to it too, if you're interested. Okay, and then I further have more resources that are from IBM, especially the IBM developer website. Um, you can actually search for all kinds, but for today's two, maybe relevant would be like cloud, uh, cloud DevOps, Cloud Native, uh, you can find all of these um, kind of guidelines in there and, and ex explanation. And then if you want to kind of get your hands into working with Java on IBM Cloud too, there's also a very nice uh, tutorial on Cloud Native overview. And then uh, CNCF, right, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the 12 vector app. So if you want to take a look at those. And then also I want to invite you to, if you are interested, I, I do run a live coding stream every Wednesday on Twitch. So uh, at about 1.30, uh, so it'd be like late for you, I know, 9.30 in Ukraine, right? Uh, if it isn't too late, right, you, please join. Um, there are also other streams, uh, topics too, kind of from time to time. But for mine, I consistently run it on every Wednesday. Uh, so if you'd like to join. So, and I talk about Java, Cloud Native, all of these things, and just chatting and you can, you know, request to be on screen, all these things I kind of support too. So, okay. And then there's also our expert TV. So these are also kind of uh, targeted, like kind of um, topics that uh, folks will have, you know, from time to time too. Uh, there's also one actually quite consistent is on application modernization, for example. So please kind of check that out. And then we are also on meetup.com. They are like a free, uh, a lot of free uh, uh, workshops. For example, you can get like an open shift cluster for 48 hours. You can try things out. You get a you know tutorial all for free. And then also, I have my Chicago Java Users Group, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, that I would like to invite you all to check out our meetups if you like. Um, I try to run some meetups at, in the midday, especially if we have speakers from Europe, for example, different time zones. So so then you can also join. Otherwise, we also have recordings too. So please visit our site. And then sign up. I talk about the IBM Cloud. So this is how you can get a free uh, use of two hundred dollars credit um, U.S. dollar, right? And uh, cloud.ibm.com. Again, we may have uh, classes that offer to you for free to get a free uh, OpenShift cluster for a little bit, at a temporary time. So, and here this. Um, this is how you can stay in touch with me, and I invite all of you to join me on this court. That's my link to this court, because then we can continue the conversation. Um, and of course, there's also Q&A session right after. So please stay if you'd like to talk more. And this is my Twitter handle, my LinkedIn uh, link, uh, you know, URL, and then my GitHub repository, and also my blog site uh, on Dev.2. So with that, I think I'm like a little bit, a few minutes past the time, right? Am I correct? You have to say, thank you. Thank you for letting me talk a little over. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mary. Yeah, that, that's, that's totally fine for being out of time. You shared lots of very useful links for, with our participants. So that, that's, yeah, that's no problem. And I'm sure mm -hmm. our participants will be interested in your live Twitter sessions. It sounds really, really yeah. great and impressive. So I'm sure you will get some, some people from Ukraine shortly there that's great yeah, yeah. thank you uh, yeah so mary thank you so much for uh, for conducting the talk at devox ukraine this year and i invite you to thank continue you. the live discussion in the q a session so you okay. can find the link uh, in rocket in the discussion uh, menu wow. okay yeah. so please okay. yeah please oh, continue and wonderful. thank you so much and hope to see you in person next year <laughs> Yes, yes, yeah. Thank yes. you. Everybody have a great day or well, good night, right? It's already <laughs> evening time. So have and a good great night. day <laughs> to you. Yeah. Thank bye. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.